Right, image sharpening. What a topic. Sharpening images is like when you go food shopping. Sharpening images is like when you wash your car and um, no, no, it's dreadful as well. So you want to sharpen your photos. Enough with the crap analogies. Sharpening your images is like any other part of post-processing. It runs on a spectrum. You could say, I'm happy to dedicate the next three months of my life to editing this photo. Or you could say, that's a nice preset, done. And it's the same with sharpening. You can spend hours optimizing and tweaking your sharpening, or you just push the slider a bit and go, yep, yeah, sharpen. But for me, pushing that little slider in Lightroom doesn't really cut the mustard. See, there are three different kinds of sharpening. Input sharpening, creative sharpening, and output sharpening. And they all matter and they all make a difference. I've got a process that takes two or three minutes for an image and it's perfectly doable unless you've got, you know, thousands of images, that would be a long time. But if you've only got a couple, this is how I do it. Also, just before we jump into Lightroom, um, like all these videos, just because I'm doing a video about sharpening, it doesn't mean I think I'm the authority on sharpening. There are plenty of people that know an awful lot more than I do, and I'm always open to learning. So if you think I missed anything in this video, or you just think you've got an entirely better process, then um, please let me know in the comments. I always love to learn. But this is how I do it for the time being, until you tell me a better way. So here we are in Lightroom, and I've loaded this image that I took in New Zealand last year. So as you can see, I've been pushing around the sliders a little bit just to tweak the color and things like that. But a couple of changes that I haven't made so far are anything to do with the clarity of the image or the sharpening. Now, despite the fact that I've not done anything with the sharpening, as you can see, these sliders aren't at zero. And that's because I imported this image as a raw file. Whenever you import an image into Lightroom as a raw file, you get this default uh, import sharpening, an amount of 25, a radius of one, detail of 25. And that's because Lightroom assumes a certain amount of lens blur and therefore it has a default amount of sharpening to correct for that lens blur. Now, if you've ever imported JPEGs into Lightroom, you might have noticed that you don't get this default sharpening. And that's because when you have a JPEG file, it's already been processed and compressed and Lightroom assumes that as part of that process, uh, some sharpening will already have taken place. Now, generally speaking, this input sharpening is, is quite helpful, uh, but it's important that it stays subtle because you don't really have all that much flexibility as to where it's applied. Yes, you have a masking slider here, but generally speaking, uh, the sharpening is applied flatly across the entire image. So if you want flexibility and to be able to do any kind of creative sharpening as we do for this image and indeed most images, then you're gonna to need to go into Photoshop. So that's what we're gonna do next. Right, so here we are in Photoshop and for a long time, I have used a method for sharpening, which is a very popular method, but probably isn't the optimum method. But you've probably heard of it, it's called the high pass filter. So if I just make sure that my background layer isn't locked and I duplicate it, I then go to filter, other, confusingly, not sharpen, other, and high pass. Uh, then you'll see we get this strange kind of look. And if I take down this radius, don't know why it's so high, if I take it down to something like four pixels, then press OK, then you'll see that basically what we have here is these really harsh edges. Now, four pixels is way too strong. I'm just doing four pixels really for the purpose of this video. Um, you'd also see that we've got some color bleed here, which we don't want. So we're gonna go to image, adjustments and desaturate to get rid of that. Uh, and all I'm gonna do now is zoom out uh, and go up to my blend modes. And I've got a choice here. I can either go to overlay, which will give me kind of a, a medium amount of sharpening for this particular radius setting. I can go to soft light, which will give me a slightly softer version or linear light, which will give me a quite an extreme version to be honest. So if I go to linear light first, what you'll see is the sharpening is way overdone. That's off, that's on. Uh, if I go to overlay, this is on, that's off, so slightly softer. Um, and if I go to soft light, if I turn it off first and then on, it's it's barely anything. Uh, but typically I, I stick around at overlay. Now this is quite an effective method of sharpening and in truth, unless you're uh, really pixel peeping, I think this method is completely fine. It's just not the best way to do it, technically speaking. Um, now there are lots of other methods that have been argued in forums for many years. Uh, and one of those is called the unsharp mask. So if I just get rid of this layer and create another duplicate layer, uh, if I then make sure that that's converted to a smart object, 
and again go to filters and this time sharpen which makes a bit more sense I'll then go to unsharp mask which to me doesn't make sense don't know why it's called that uh, then you have a couple of sliders similar to how you have sliders in Lightroom so you have a mount which is fairly straightforward just an amount of sharpening you have radius which determines how much of an edge uh, is taken into account when the sharpening is taking place the more you have the more crazy the effect will look um, and you have threshold and with threshold basically the lower the threshold the less contrast there has to be in order for the sharpening to take place so if you increase the threshold then Photoshop will only sharpen in areas of very very high contrast uh, so typically I leave that fairly low and just make the amount less so the unsharp mask has, has again been a very popular way of going about things now with both the high pass and the unsharp mask one of the benefits of doing this over Lightroom is that obviously with the smart filter you can use it as a layer mask and just paint away any of the areas of sharpening that you don't want. You can also use the blend if options um, if you need to to get rid of some of the sharpening that you might not want. You just have a lot more options. Your, your sharpening doesn't have to be applied to the whole image. But the unsharp mask still isn't the optimal tool to use. Now in these sharpen filters you'll see that there are lots of different options. A lot of them are just buttons to be honest. If I go to sharpen it will just apply an algorithm and give me a generic sharpen. I don't have any options to, to chop and change that other than using the layer masks and the blend if um, as I've said with the other options but it's, it's not great. There are tools that are a lot more powerful and namely one in particular is so if we go to smart sharpen you'll see that again we get another pop-up box just like the unsharp mask the difference here though is that we have a few more options so again you'll see these sliders that are becoming fairly commonplace by now slightly different names but broadly they do the same thing amount radius and reduce noise one difference is that you've got a few different algorithm options here now if you set to gaussian blur this algorithm and this tool will basically work in much the same way or exactly the same way i think as the unsharp mask uh, which you may think is fine but I think I'm right in saying that the unsharp mask wasn't initially designed by Adobe as a tool to use with digital photos it was actually designed as a tool to be used with scanned photos now if you go to lens blur this is an algorithm that has been developed for use uh, with digital photos so by default it should be a bit more practical the other benefit of using the smart sharpen tool is that you have control of shadows and highlights separately so as you can see there's a fade amount slider and basically what that means is that if I go to shadows if I think the effect that I've chosen up here is too strong in the shadows then I can basically fade that away with this slider tonal width is the the number of tones within the shadows that will be affected by that change and the radius well we've come across radius dozen times already and you can do the same with the highlights so you get generally speaking a lot more control with your sharpening than you do even with the unsharp mask this though still isn't my favorite way to sharpen now so if I turn that smart sharpen off I again go to filter and this time to camera raw filter then you'll see that we're presented with basically uh, the camera raw interface now if I just go to this sharpen module I think it's called a module the sharpen button whatever you'd like to call it um, then again you broadly get the same sliders as you've seen before the difference here though is that we get real-time information when we're making the changes so what do I mean by that well if you hover over a mount and press alt on your keyboard as you adjust this slider you'll see that the image turns black and white and that's just so that when you're making the change uh, you can make that change independent of being affected by uh, what the colors are doing. Color can be fairly distracting when you're making some changes in post-production so getting rid of that color can be quite helpful. Now I'm currently committing a cardinal sin in that I'm trying to do my sharpening without being zoomed in to 100%. Um, when you do any sharpening typically you want to be uh, zoomed in to 100% so you can see exactly what you're doing. So here I am at 100% if I want to move around the image I'll just press the space bar to bring up the hand tool and just move around like so and with all these sliders if I keep pressing alt then I'll get lots and lots of useful information while I move the slider up and down so with radius for example I can really fine-tune that just looking at the edges and the detail that I think I want to be included uh, in the sharpening process if I go to detail move that all the way up you can see there or hope you can see you might not be able to see on the video but I've included way too much noise there so I'm going to bring that right down until I've just got the details that I want to be included in the sharpening maybe something like five and then masking if I keep alt held down then the masking slider will work just like uh, a layer mask basically so if I move this up 
as you can see it becomes black and white and black won't be included in the sharpen and the white will. Black conceals, white reveals. So I think I want that to be something around that. Um, if I want to do some noise reduction, again I keep Alt held down uh, and I go to luminance and you can see again it's black and white and I can make those changes independent of colour. You'll also see a colour slider here. I don't see much noise that's been too affected by colour so I'm not going to bother with that. Uh, but again you've got lots of options even when it comes to noise reduction. Uh, I apologise if you can hear my laptop go mad. I don't think it particularly enjoys it when I do screen recordings. It's, uh, yeah, it's going crazy at the moment. So sorry if you can hear that. But I'm going to click OK. And as you can see, the camera raw filter comes up under my smart filters. So again, if I wanted to, I could use the smart filters mask to just mask away areas of the sharpening that I've included that I didn't intend to. Or I can use the blending options and just play around with the sliders to really fine tune what is included in the sharpening. Or I can just double click the camera raw filter again and make further changes to what I've already done. All of that means that I get a load of control when it comes to creative sharpening. But the final piece of the puzzle, the output sharpening, I do back in Lightroom. Okay, so we're back in Lightroom and it's time to do an export, which means we need to do some output sharpening. To do that, I'm gonna bring up the export window. Okay, so I'm gonna save this image as a TIFF. Um, I'm gonna resize it and I want the short edge to be 1500 pixels wide. Uh, I then go to output sharpening and I want it sharpened, but I don't want it sharpened for a screen. I want it sharpened for matte paper because this particular export is going to be done for a print. Now the reason output sharpening is important is because it's based on size. All the previous sharpening we've done has been based purely on the original size of the image. When we change that size you need to make adjustments in the sharpening and Lightroom with its output sharpening allows us to do that. Now it's not the most flexible offering in the world. Uh, you can see we've got three different amounts and for matte paper I might decide to go standard. But what's important to say is that it's worth testing these things out. I might choose low, standard or high but it's important that I check the image after I've done that because that might not be the optimal setting. Uh, and you may find that that optimal setting changes based on the image and how much sharpening you've done to the image previously before you've got to the output sharpening. Nevertheless, it is a handy tool, but it's worth saying also that it requires some testing and you can't just expect just because you've chosen matte paper and standard and you're going to print to matte paper that it's going to come out with the absolute optimal result. Sure, it might be absolutely fantastic, but if you're looking for the last grains of detail and you really want to optimise the image, then like all things, you're going to have to do some testing. Okay, that's that. Thanks for watching. Um, like I said before, if you think you've got a better way of sharpening or a more effective way or a more efficient way, please let me know. And until the next time, thank you very much for watching. Thank you.